and so so people who who were even building to a no no clean standard were starting to see failures in the field and and based off of this it really comes down to if you don't have a, a, a way to outgas, a way for those soldering materials to work in their design characteristics, that residue set can be active. And not only is it active, but the distance between the conductive paths has narrowed as well, which means you've increased your electrical field. That's my guest, Mike Pixenman. We'll be talking about cleaning for reliability, challenging components and fluxes, methods to determine how clean is clean enough, and how and why he co-founded Kaizen Corporation. All of this and more coming up on this episode of Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to another episode of Reliability Matters. My guest today is Dr. Mike Bixenman. Mike is one of the founders of Kaizen Corporation and serves as its chief technology officer. Mike is well known within the electronic assembly industry and is a featured speaker at industry conferences and symposiums around the world. Mike is the chair of the IPC Cleaning and Coding Conference, which is held every two years in Chicago and is the technical chair for SMTA Europe's Electronics and Harsh Environments Conference, held annually in Amsterdam. Mike has also received the IPC President's Award and has chaired the IPC Cleaning Handbook Task Group. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Mike. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you being my guest. I believe it was 1990 when you co-founded Kaizen Corporation. Uh, what did you do before Kaizen, and, and more interestingly, perhaps, what led you to form Kaizen? Well, that's an interesting question. I started my career early, Mike. I actually worked for my dad's company. My dad was uh, an entrepreneur in the, the truest form, and he had a business where he made different stains and finishes, uh, the paint and sundry business. He also made coating and paint removers. And so it was a chemical business that was driven by both the industrial side and the retail side. So um, I've been involved in, in looking at chemically based material sets for most of my career. And in those early days when I, when I did work for my dad, I had a lot of training and mentoring from a German chemist by the name of Dr. Otto Hoyer. And he, he taught me how to, um, to, to engineer material sets, uh, whether it was on the coating side or, or trying to take those coatings off. And what's kind of similar in this electronic space is the design of those material sets and their functional parts that make them work are are very consistent from what I did in that life to uh, to to what we do on the electronic space today interesting and um, uh, chemicals run in your educational background is that correct uh, that is correct um, I did my education the hard way um, you know I um, when I started my career I I basically worked and went to school along the way. So all of the areas that, that, um, that I was fortunate to, to earn different degrees were, were while I was working at the same time. And so what I tried to do was, was focus my, ac- my academic studies on what it was that, that I was trying to do. So a lot of my chemical background came from, you know, both the educational side and and the work experience, and then the business studies that I did uh, came from trying to to say, okay, how do we serve the customer better? How do we operate a business that can be successful in the future? So so a lot of what I did in my career path was really focused on continuous learning and trying to get better at you know, what the products that we were trying to design and the 
the companies that we were trying to serve. Yeah, I remember it. It probably was longer ago than I recall, but um, I remember when you were going through your doctorate program um, to earn your uh, DBA. Um, you interviewed our company and, and probably many others, I, I believe, as part of your thesis. Is that correct? Yes, it was. And, and I was going to mention that, Mike. I, I really do appreciate you uh, being a part of that process. When, when I did my doctoral study, I did it on collaborative innovation. And my whole thought process was very much on this open movement this open source movement that, that we find ourselves in today. And so the, the thought process was, is that not all of us have, have knowledge in, in all areas. And if you can form powerful collaborations, they help you not only to innovate, but to solve customer problems. And so as I was, and that was the whole focus of, of my thesis was, is, can you use open innovation to, to not only improve, uh, improve the innovation process or the creative process, but can you use that with different people, different organizations to help solve customer problems? And it's been kind of a theme that, that I have used throughout my career. I've done a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of research with many different people in this industry and even outside this industry. You are one of them, by the way. And it's been through that process that has enabled me to, to gain a better understanding of areas that I did not necessarily know, but to highlight areas that were important or areas that really caused issues or problems in trying that customers were dealing with. So it's been through that whole process that, uh, that my growth is really uh, come from over the course of time. And we're going to talk about collaborative innovation. I know that there's a very recent example with yourself and another company on the subject of collaborative innovation. We're going to get to that a little bit later on in the podcast. But before we get there, I'm going to, my questions tend to start with diatribes and then they end in a question. So here's my long diatribe, which I promise will morph into a question. When Kaizen was formed, uh, all those years ago, it offered the electronics assembly industry an alternative to the newly banned CFC-based solvents. And within a few short years, the majority of the industry, as we all know, switched to aqueous-based chemicals like the ones Kaizen and others introduced. I recall the, a, a terrific effort that w was required to convince assemblers that water was a safe and effective alternative to solvents. It took so many years but eventually, aqueous cleaning processes became mainstream, like they are today. Just when we thought the hardest part was behind us, um, which is probably anyone in business can say that, just when they think the hardest part was behind them, dot, 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 we began to see changes in our industry that would increase the difficulty of cleaning. We, we kind of got people saying, okay, yeah, aqueous cleaning, that's the way to go. But then all of a sudden, the industry made changes and it made cleaning far more difficult. Challenges such as miniaturization and increased density of components, uh, changes in solder alloys, uh, for, for example, from lead free or from lead to lead free, which increased the soldering temperatures and temperature has always been the enemy of cleaning, whether you're cleaning pots and pans or circuit boards and leadless components with bottom terminations. All those factors have added to the challenges of modern cleaning applications. This, while higher frequencies and higher voltages have uh, and the and the introduction of of applications, electronic applications into harsh environments like we've seen with Internet of Things and automotive and all that, they've decreased an assembly's tolerance for residue while increasing the need for cleaning. Kind of a, the perfect storm. In here's where I get to a question. In the cleaning equipment world, we responded with bigger pumps, higher pressures smaller water particle sizes, higher temperature capabilities, and other mechanical um, improvements to meet the need. In your world of cleaning chemicals, how did your industry respond to the growing challenges that I mentioned and the continuing challenges that are in front of us uh, and the increased environmental requirements placed on, on chemical companies? So how did you deal with that perfect storm of more difficult uh, to clean parts and more environmental regulations on top of that? 
It's a very good question, Mike. You know, as as we looked over the course of time and when we first started the process of, of saying, okay, CFCs are are back in, in the day when, when they were being used, they were mainly being used by your military contractors. They were rosin-based fluxes. You know, rosin was a material set that w- within those CFCs, it was chlorinated hydrocarbon. It would it would dissolve and, and they would azeotrope some alcohol in to, re, to remove the ionics in nature. And, and when, you know, the solvent-based materials, the, the beauty of the solvent process was is that you could clean, you would capture your contaminants, they would be captured into the boil side of that piece of equipment and you were always constantly distilling to bring fresh chemistry back over to be able to rinse the part free of contamination. And it was a simple process that people used. But back to your point, when people look to say, what are we gonna replace these type of material sets with? What's going to work into our industry into the future? what really happened was a a very disruptive uh, period of time. And actually it was a very innovative period of time. During that period, companies like ourselves said, okay, if, if these chlorinated or these highly volatile material sets, which do have environmental issues, they do bring chemical constituents into the environmental space, which, which is, is an environmental issue. How do you go about solving that problem? And so that's where the, on the material side, there was a big change. And back in that period of time, there was the terpene based materials. Petrofirm was a company in that point of time. DuPont was also a player in that time where they, they were looking at hydrocarbon based materials to, to, to clean these different electronics based materials. And, and when we looked at it, we, we looked at it and said, and, and where the real opportunity came from the very beginning and, and you referenced back into, you know, 1990, it actually started a little bit before then. It was really interesting because it, where where I was at in, in my organization, that my previous organization, I had bought materials from a, a company that my partner, or soon to be partner, Kyle Doyle, actually worked for. And he asked me at that point in time, he said, have you ever thought about cleaning electronics? And I said, no. And he said, you know, there's a company very near to me that, um, that, that has an interest in doing that. And it, at the time it was Delco Electronics. And he said, would you like me to introduce you to an engineer there? And I said, sure, I would very much like that opportunity. And so I got an opportunity to, to meet a gentleman. His name was George Whoop. And the guy he's working with at the time was Terry Munson. And Terry at the time was on the forefront of, of trying to detect these material sets using iron chromatography. And at that point in time, we had an opportunity to look at these hybrid circuits and, and say, how do you clean them? And, and what, what we did originally was design some material sets that were solvent based, but they were solvent based, but you rinse them with water. And what turned out to be a, a very u- unique uh, development in that was that water material is a polar material that was very effective at removing the ionic contamination. You could remove the rosin constituent with the solvent base, but if you had that rinsing mechanism, you could leave a very clean, clean, uh, you know, electronic set. Going back to one of the points that you always make, Mike, is, is that how clean is, is what's the ultimate cleanliness level? And it's zero ionic contamination. Sure. So, you know, water really was, was that, that unique molecule that, that provided that. Well, in, in some of the early days when, when we were in this industry, 
you know, the, the early materials were semi-aqueous materials. They were really solvent-based materials which were followed with the water rinse. And some of the early thought was is that if we make these solvents that are not really soluble in water, we can extract them and we can use them over and over again. And it was an interesting time in process, but back to your point, a lot of these components, if, if you caught those materials into areas on the circuit card, if they didn't rinse very well, they'd seep out and they would cause defects later on. And so as, as we, we learned a, a, about this industry, we, we found the real value that water really brought. And it still brings that value today, especially in this electronic space. But we also found that, you know, in, in some cases, people at that point in time were using saponified cleaning agents. And a saponified cleaning agent is, is a material set that uses an oxygenated solvent, but it also uses uh, an amine-based material that would saponify, react, oxidize, and reduce the rosin-based molecule that would allow it to uh, to be dissolved and, and rinsed away. In layman's terms, it and turned the, it into soap, right? Yeah, it did. And, and, and during that process, that too worked very well, but those were very highly saponified material sets that they would degrade over time. Uh, you, you would spray them and, and the CO2 in the air would, would cause that material set to oxidize and reduce in its own right. And what, what people found was is that they didn't have a very long bath life. One of the things that, that we looked at in this industry is we said, would it be possible to take these solvent-based materials that, that were, were relatively uh, solvent or, or, or dissolved in water and make a pseudo semi-aqueous material in an aqueous footprint? And our first shot at doing that was a product called Solvent Sprayable Alcohol. I think you remove, remember it, Mike, because you ran some of it. It used to be what we called our SSA-based material. Yeah, I, I do remember that, early days. And, and in those early days, um, the material set, we did some testing, and not only did it work well, but we were able to extend the bath life or, or the amount of time that people could use it, but there was a big difference. If you think about the saponified-based materials, they worked at a at a concentration range of three to 10% range. Well, these materials, because you weren't driving so much with that saponification mechanism, it required a higher concentration. And back in that day and the time, we were running around 30% concentration with those material sets. And, and we got an opportunity, uh, which was the real break in, in our, our company was, the first couple of years that we were in business, we didn't hardly sell anything. We were operating on fumes. I mean, we were hoping just to be able to survive. But we were trying to lead up to that. Day, day in the life to, of a startup, Mike. That's a day in the life of a startup. <laughs> I think we've all been there. And anyone in their own business is probably shaking their heads right now in agreement. Yeah. And, and so you're exactly right, Mike. In some cases, a startup is not for the weak and pain of heart because you learn along the way and you learn from those objections and you try to try to understand them well. But in our case, the big break that, that we got was we, we went through and, and we invested all the money we had to, to perform an IPC phase two test. And we passed that test with flying colors and it was the, the door that opened that those defense contractors started to come to us and it started the business going and the business evolved from that point in time. But back to your original question, as we started to see the dynamics of the industry and the industry itself is a classic dematerialization concept. And I like to, to equate it back to, to our mobile phones that, that we all use today. And what a remarkable device and what a, a remarkable ability to, to utilize all these different apps to use that, that, that simple little, or I, I say uh, that, that phone to do a lot of different, um, just like taking pictures and, and, and all of those 
characteristics that it allowed people to to stop using other devices and to hone in on that device. When we saw, we saw all of that, and that led back to your Internet of Things, what we started to see was we started to see a, a lot of effectiveness in smaller footprints. But at the same time, during that whole period of time, the big disruption that um, that 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 I made mention to earlier was the, the the concept of the soldering companies developing no clean solder paste, developing these material sets that were very effective at soldering, but they left a hydrophobic barrier behind that prevented moisture ingress into the residue that was most problematic on electronics. And hydro hydrophobic and so, meaning it not soluble in water. That that is exactly correct. And during that period of time, back to to the Delco Electronics example, I was amazed at their operation because one of the things that they did, they said, you know, this is the technology we want to use. And so they really develop the, the ability to utilize that technology. And it all started very quickly from knowing that you had to it, to be a no clean shop or a no clean process. It started from the components, the boards that came in, they had to meet certain specifications. The selection of the materials and the processes, they had to be extremely well controlled. The way you handled those boards during the manufacturing or the assembly process, you had to handle them correctly. Um, you had to have control over every aspect of that assembly process. And today, it, it really won the day in the early days, Mike. And, and you know this as well as I do. You know, the, the subset of companies that continued to see the value of cleaning were those class three manufacturers. But as time went on, class three and, being for those who aren't in, in the electronics industry, class three being um, aerospace and critical uh, reliability mandated uh, products. You're exactly correct. And, and so as as time went on, though, companies started to see different failures and they started to, to look at those failures and and they you know, even though they were building with a material set that was a, a very reliable material in its own right, and under the right conditions, those materials work extremely well. But where where I started to, or, or in in some of the the areas that I was involved in and worked with, one of the areas that that I always tried to focus on, Mike, is is where is the problem you know, where the, our customers experiencing issues and, and they're trying to solve those issues. And, and one of the issues that, that really led to this was a lot of the, the, the component sets, we were moving away from the hassle finish to, to even lead free during this process where, where we were going more into planar finishes and the, the components were getting smaller. And as the components were laid down onto the circuit card, all of a sudden, you know, there wasn't a very large, what I call standoff gap between the soldered component and the bottom, bottom termination or the underside of that component. And one of the things that we learned through research was is that is that component uh, standoff gap gets less than two mils. And in some cases, you look at these bottom terminated components and they're like one mil standoff off the board. What happens is, and you have a high solder mask underneath or a high level of solder underneath these components. All of a sudden, the level of contamination that was trapped underneath that component was, was exponentially higher. And the, the, um, the residue underneath those components, instead of being a hydro, hydrophobic shell that was hard, was more pliable. And 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 all of a sudden, you know, the uh, what we started to learn was the flux itself; those outgassing channels were being blocked. 
and so so people who who were even building to a no no clean standard were starting to see failures in the field and and based off of this it really comes down to if you don't have a a, a way to outgas a way for those soldering materials to work in their design characteristics that residue set can be active and not only is it active but the distance between the conductive paths has narrowed as well, which means you've increased your electrical field. So let me ask you, Mike, is there is there a disconnect between, you know, we're talking about um, electrical components with bottom terminated features. Uh, we're talking about zero gap or very low gap. Is there a disconnect between component manufacturers and the manufacturing process? Does DFM land, does a concept of design for manufacturability land on component manufacturers? Because it seems to me, because I've heard you speak on this and others uh, as well, that we're taking components that are designed to be slammed to the board and now advising um, assemblers to change the design of their boards, you know, route out some of the solder mask or create more clearance uh, mechanically for a part that wasn't really designed to have that clearance. Uh, there seems to be, if we're having to take a, a standard part and then and then turn manufacturing on its head to use it, otherwise face failures, there's, there seems to be some disconnect between component manufacturers uh, and, um, and actual assemblers. Am I, am I seeing that right? You're seeing it exactly right, Mike. What, what occurred was is that the large part of the market, the, the no clean market, and as we look at these IoT consumer-based based products, they are, they drive so much more volume of manufacturing than maybe at the time, these aerospace, the defense contractors, the people who were really cleaning at the time and saw the value of cleaning, that these component manufacturers, it wasn't even on the radar. And even today, there are components out there that many people struggle with. Um, the one that I commonly think about are these flip chip BGAs with these heat spreader uh, lids that that are vented. You know, these are component types that are designed mostly for a no clean process. But when, when you get back to the size of the market, these high reliability guys, you know, amount of electronics that they build versus these consumer based devices are, are, are much, much smaller. So, so, you know, now you, you saw some, some of these issues starting to rise, but the good news for people today and, and whether, you know, and, and as I look at, at this whole issue of cleaning, what has amazed me that many people who would never have considered it in the past see the value of it and are using it today in some form or, or fashion, but even on this component side, there is research that's being done that will 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 solve this problem in the future. It only takes a couple mils of, of gap height that can can dramatically reduce this effect. And we're starting to see that on some of the components types. There, there are pillars that are starting to be designed into some of these components like these bottom terminated components that will help lift them. And if you do that, you now are going to open the process window. If you're cleaning, you're going to open the process window to allow the material sets to, to create that flow pattern, to get to that residue, to be able to clean the residue. If you're running a no clean shop, you're going to have better outgassing channels. So I think with any problem, Mike, it eventually gets solved. Uh, but I think your characterization is 100% accurate, is, is that there was a disconnect. And the disconnect was is, is that the companies who a lot of these components were being sold to, cleaning wasn't on their roadmap. Right. Well, I think one of the other disconnects is this whole concept of no clean. When component manufacturers are, are designing a product for a no clean flux, you know, no clean, the problem, and you've heard me say this before at the various workshops we've done together, um, 
quit calling it no clean. I mean, the, the whole industry needs to stop calling it no clean. They need to call it low residue because no clean is an instruction. And, and one can't say not to clean unless they know exactly, you know, the reliability expectation of the products, the climactic end use environment it's going to go into, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but because they're building these parts for no clean, they're assuming incorrectly that they are not going to be cleaned. And in reality, um, the majority of our customers are cleaning no clean. We did a, a webinar earlier this week, and we took a live poll, and, and we asked uh, the respondents to the poll, you know, how, what's the percentage of boards that are being cleaned? Now, keep in mind this is skewed because this is a cleaning uh, webinar that we were doing, people wanting to get more information on cleaning. So that skews the answers a little bit. But still, only 2%, we had a lot of people on, on the poll, only 2% of the respondents claim they don't clean anything. They actually run a no clean process. Uh, 98% said they clean some or all of their boards. And then when we asked them what the most common flux was, 53% of the respondents out of four flux categories, 53% of the respondents said they're running no clean. So one can extrapolate from that, that most of the no clean is being cleaned, which, which throws off the, the design intent for a lot of these parts, you know, where, well, you don't have to worry about cleaning it. It can't be cleaned because there's no, there's no gap or a very low gap. So it's very difficult to clean, but don't worry, you're not going to be cleaning it. Well, that's not true. Most people running no clean are cleaning the no clean and with parts that were really not designed to be cleaned. So, you know, I think that's another level of disconnect. Well, the reason why I think that's, that's the case, Mike, is the research in these soldering materials. And when we think about a soldering material, it's a complex, you know, uh, approach that in, in these materials and in, in how they engineer them, you want certain material sets to outgas. You want certain material sets to decompose at certain levels. You want, uh, and, and, you know, as you remove those metal oxides onto a part, you want that oxygen barrier, that rosin resin based material to protect that soldering during that, uh, that reflow process. And so all the research that moved forward back in, in this 1990 timeframe or this Montreal protocol timeframe till today has been focused on these no clean material sets. And some of the remarkable breakthroughs on these pace are, are, are really good, but that's where the research went. And so you are correct. Today, most all people, if, uh, unless they're using a water soluble material, most people are using the basis of these no clean material sets that have been designed over time because those material sets give you the best overall yields, the best overall performance on you know, the, the solder joint integrity, the, you know, the voiding aspects of, of it. So, so I think bec due to that, Mike, that's where the, that's where the research was. And today people who, who build high reliability electronics and they do clean them, that's why they use those material sets. Yeah, I totally agree. We had one of the, at the end of this week's webinar, we had a Q and A and one of the questions was, well, if everyone's cleaning, why don't they just use, why don't they just use water soluble flux? Why are they cleaning no clean, which is arguably a little bit harder to clean. And you know, one of the answers I gave, and I, I don't know if it's technically accurate, but I think it it's mostly accurate is, you know, I don't know if there's been a, a new water soluble flux introduced, you know, in, in 30 years, it's, 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 and, and there hasn't been a need to because the entire industry, for the most part, switched to no clean. That's where the engineering is. That's where the technology is. Um, it, and it's, it's supported and it's fresh and it's new and it's, it's, um, it's highly evolving. The other, you know, rosin-based fluxes and, and organic acid fluxes, I don't know if much changed in a long time. It's like listening to, you know, a 70s station. It's, it's good, um, but it's, it's not trendy and it's not leading edge and it doesn't contain, you know, a lot of new technology like one would find in a, in a no clean. Well, one of the things you have to remember about water soluble based materials is it's highly risky to use those materials. No matter if, um, if you're even cleaning with a, with a water process, they are so active, Mike, that 
it, you can leave very small levels of those materials trapped underneath the component and it will fail quickly if it's in yeah. a moist and humid environment. Sure. The, the, the other aspect of a water soluble material is, is that it doesn't have the same level of oxygen barrier built into its formulation. So as, as you go into this, these lead free base materials and you, you're, you're more into a hotter reflow profile, what happens is, is that you lose that oxygen barrier. And when you lose that, those salt formations that occur during a water soluble process, in some cases are harder to clean than a no clean process. So in many respects, I believe water soluble materials, they do have their place like all technologies have their place, but they're very risky. When you look at, at the, the signal that you can detect off a of water soluble material that, that is still remaining, it can fail extremely fast. And, and so that's one of the reasons why I believe also that was another trend that back when people were cleaning, a lot of people were cleaning with water soluble based materials or, or they were using water soluble based materials and cleaning with just straight DI water. But I've seen that trend move away. It's not to say it's totally gone, but I believe the reason for that is, is is both the yields off of the off of you know as as you get to these highly dense material sets. But if you do leave any residue behind, and you you are if that device operates in any type of moist or humid environment, you have a high risk of failure, chemical failures. Yeah, we tell our customers, um, you know, if you're running water soluble, uh, only because you've always run water soluble, then go ahead and stick with it. Just uh, make sure you run a chemical in your wash process because as I'll wait for that to stop. We'll edit that out and we'll edit out the cough I had earlier too. I forgot to pop myself down when I coughed. There we go. One of the things we tell our customers is if you're running a water soluble flux, still use a chemical because, um, you know, one of the things that we harp on regularly in all of our, um, workshops and webinars and, and the like is that it really isn't a defluxing process you're running. It's a cleaning process you're running. And if one thinks of it as a defluxing process, which is easy to do, um, then one considers the only target contamination species to be removed as flux. But as you're well aware, uh, and, and most people who are cleaning uh, now are well aware, there are so many more stowaway residues. I like to call them the usual suspects. There's residues from... Uh, board fabrication and component fabrication and the entire assembly process. And then we add flux as icing on top of the cake. And if we think we're only trying to remove the flux, we're going to leave potentially a lot of other residue. Um, so if one is running a water soluble flux, run a chemical, R run it as if there were other uh, non water soluble, non polar chemicals uh, or contamination species left on the board. Uh, and, and that way you don't have to worry about, if I left uh, any active flux on the board. Uh, also, you know, there is an advantage of running to some um, of running water soluble, and that is a, because it's such a highly active flux. Uh, if someone doesn't have fresh leads, if there's a little bit of oxidation on, on some component leads and pads, you, know, you stand a little better chance it's a stronger flux, but because it's a stronger flux, it has to be removed. And one of the downsides of it as well everything has pros and cons. One of the con sides of it is, you know, the, once the board comes out of the reflow oven, the clock has started. And, you know, the old, the old uh, weapon spec used to uh, say, you know, if you want to run anything but RMA, it's subject to review and disapproval. But if you do run a, a water-soluble flux, it has to be cleaned within an hour. And very few processes go from uh, the end of a reflow oven to a cleaning system within an hour. There's inspection and other things that may happen or secondary soldering that might happen between it. So the whole time that flux is sitting on a board, not removed, it's still thinking it's flux and it's, it's not fully, the activators are still uh, there. They're not been, they've not been fully burned off and, and the board starts to oxidize and get attacked by the material until it's fully removed. Yeah, Mike, I, I agree with you. The, the, the value of using a engineered cleaning material are, are couple fold. One is the material sets are going to wet 
they're they're going to to do a good job of being able to get underneath those highly constrained components, those very low standoff components, which again, that's where the bulk of your failures would occur. If if you if you had a water soluble flux that you left behind. Secondly, back to the earlier point where if you had a higher reflow temperature and you started to to leave behind some you know, some unsoluble residues within that water matrix, the cleaning agent's going to be much more effective in making sure that you can clean those residue sets. So it's it's an added level of, uh, from a reliability standpoint, assurance that you're actually going to clean that part. You're going to clean it adequately, and in, in some respects. You don't necessarily have to run as high of a concentration as you might would for cleaning certain no clean material sets. But I agree with you. I believe that's a good practice. Yeah, I think that kind of falls into cleaning best practices. If you're going to go through a cleaning process, make sure you clean everything that could be on the board, not just uh, selected targets. So a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, what do you consider is the biggest threat to electronics reliability? I guess... I'll go back to Doug's answer. It depends. There, there's three key key pieces to that, Mike. There's chemical, electrical, and mechanical. The one area that you and I have, have been involved and in, other companies in our industry has been on this chemical side. And I think the the issue there is is that when you look at these smaller components, the distance, and I, and I mentioned this before, the distance between those conductive paths narrows, which means you have a higher electrical field. And if you mobilize, remember in a soldering process, you're removing metal oxides off of the, those solder spheres so that you could get a good metallurgical bond. Those metal oxides are positively charged and they're, they're trapped into the residue set. They're ionic in nature as well. And so if you were to be in a warm, humid environment, that it just takes a small level of moisture to be able to allow those positively charged metal ions to migrate from the anode to the cathode and plate backwards. And so you get either intermittence or you could get a direct short. So I think one of the, to your question, miniaturization, the use of these more uh, leadless type components, these very small gaps where that residue gets trapped. From a chemical standpoint, those are those are, are, are areas where failures can and do occur. And those are areas that people have had, have had to dealt with and try to understand. Secondly, um, any type of residue that's on a, a circuit assembly, not only can it cause leakage or electrochemical migration, but we all know about tin whiskers. And as we go to high tin alloys, there's been a lot of research that has shown that, you know, those residue sets can, can increase the propensity of, of that defect to occur. So as we think about chemical contamination, contamination of some type of residue, as electronic devices become more dense, as the power requirements increase, as the reliability aspect becomes more important, you know, that is an area that you know, becomes of critical importance to have, have a clean device. And just to give you an example of what I'm thinking about, Mike, in many respects, you know, if a device fails, and this is something that you've said a lot in, in, in how you teach people and, and in your webinars, is, is that there are a lot of devices that if they fail, they fail. It's not going to cause an issue. But, but think about the, um, uh, what has happened in the past few weeks where there's been a couple jets that that have uh, have failed in that takeoff aspect, and and those planes come down and people die. You know, the question is, why did those those uh, 
failures occur, and, and I don't know exactly why they occurred, but there's a lot of electronics that are, that are used today in, in different mission critical uh, areas. And failure is not, not something that can be tolerated. If it happens, there are critical aspects that, that people die and companies, it can cost them billions of dollars along the way. So, you know, from that, that period of, of, to answer your question, if we think about chemical contamination as one of those three legs, if, if you're building a device that it has to work, then cleanliness is a critical aspect and not only cleanliness, but being able to protect from other airborne contaminants. That means coating those boards. Those as or potting those boards, those are key key areas that people have to pay attention to. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, you know, we our industry has this view of harsh environment as something very extreme, um, like down a, uh, an uh, oil hole, you know, down an oil well or in an unpressurized part of an aircraft or in space, when in reality, uh, and and particularly with the expansion of IoT, Internet of Things, where we're sticking electronics in very unfamiliar locations like toothbrushes and shoes and footballs and things like that, um, you know, whenever something is attached to a human, humans stray into harsh environments all the time. There's a bomb cyclone going on this week in the Midwest. Uh, and, and uh, you know, arguably any electronics in an automobile or anywhere in that environment is, is uh, in an extreme harsh environment. So uh, as electronics expand, they expand into both safe and unsafe areas uh, for the electronics. And, and I, would, I would hazard to guess that most of the environments that electronics are placed in, just based on the overwhelming volume of, of electronics these days, uh, our harsh environment, and and that just pushes the cleaning, uh, it pushes the the tolerance for residue to the very edge of an envelope. Yeah, you know what's interesting about this Internet of Things that uh, that you talk about, Mike. Um, what and to your point, our electronics today have become more mobile. A- at one time, before Internet of Things were around, you know, electronics were. Were more stationary. They were more in, in environments that you didn't necessarily see, you know, that that mobile area or that uh, environmental contamination that could potentially influence this whole area. But but today, that's that's not the case. And one of the things that that made me think about that uh, your your comment was I, at, at Apex. There was a gentleman from Tesla who who gave the keynote, and and I forget his name, but you know he he talked about today and as they build these automobiles, the you know these automobiles are, are built today to where they're connected, and so they can see the performance characteristics of their electronics out in that automobile real time, and because they can see it real time. If something starts to occur, they can they can either stop it at the source of where the problem occurs, or they can make a software patch to, to help correct that problem. And, and I think today, one of the things that, that we see uh, in, in, in the environments that we live in today is one of the real benefits is now you're, you're starting to now be able to monitor devices or different critical applications and to understand what is going on. And if something starts to go uh, toward a failure mechanism, you can react to it. You can try to correct it before it becomes a catast- catastrophic event. Yeah, very true. Mike, my last question, last subject. Recently, IPC, and for those not in our industry, uh, IPC is the uh, a trade association um, and uh, a standards, uh, collaborative-based standards uh, publishing organization. They've recently uh, released a new cleanliness assessment standard. Uh, it has removed the historical pass-fail ionic contamination totals allowed on a circuit assembly and replaced it with uh, what they call an objective evidence requirement. 
So there's no longer a one number fits all standard, which is something we've been preaching for a long time um, because those standards were written back in the 70s and and are very outdated. For those assemblers that have been using rose testers, which have been, you know, the go to for five decades, they can still keep using them as long as they can produce objective evidence for their detected contamination results. Um, They can make sure that the objective evidence proves that whatever number they were uh, testing to yielded reliable products. For those assemblers that have not collected objective evidence in the past, you know, they're free to pursue alternative test methods. And I understand that you and a colleague have been working on a new test protocol uh, or newer test protocol. Uh, tell me more about your, your new company and, uh, and its product. Okay. Um, well, what led to this was back four or five years ago, um, the defense industry looked and said, you know, we need a better way to monitor cleanliness effects and, and be able to determine acceptable and unacceptable levels. And part of that, um, they issued some grants to go out and do some research that says, we need a better method at the production floor. We need a better method to be able to determine um, if there is something at risk or if our process gets out of control. And especially in areas that are very critical components that are that are they're really hard to to go back and and to look at and and to monitor. And so part of that led to uh, some research grants and I was I was privileged to be able to work with Mark McMean at STI Electronics during this whole process. And it's been a four or five year research project. We've presented probably 20 some odd papers in respect to the work that we've done over this period of time. But but one of the things that, that we focused on was trying to understand the basis of the residue where you can't see it and you, it, you can't necessarily even detect it. One of the risks, Mike, and, and you know this in the business that you're in, is a lot of these components today, you can't see the residue and, and in, a, in a sense, it can give you a false positive. You may think that your device is clean, but, the, but there may be residue present that could be problematic. And so part of that research grant, we went back and we looked at both chemical and electrical test methods. And from the chemical test method standpoint, you know, it's an extraction process. So the ROSE method is an extraction process and and it can be used as a process control device. What you're trying to understand is, is that, did something change in your process? And if it did, can I respond to it? That technic- technique is still a viable technique to do that. But when you get back to trying to understand on specific components, types, how clean or is how important is it to clean that device, number one, and more importantly, if I do clean it and I leave some errant residue, is it safe? Is it safe to to operate? So so one of the things that, that we did in the research and the company that, that we formed is a company called Magnolytics. It's a company that's a joint venture between STI Electronics and Kaizen Corporation. And what we did is we went back to a tried and true test procedure that has been around since since the beginning of the transistor and it's SIR testing, surface insulation resistance testing. But what was different and what we tried to focus on, Mike, was we tried to focus on new test vehicles, test boards that had critical components on them. And what we did is we routed sensors to where the source of the residue could be. And with those sensors, we, we took a complex test and we tried to simplify it so that it could be used at the production site so that you could take boards that were built on your production line with components that were similar. And these components could be there on test boards or break off coupons on incoming bare boards. And you could put them into an electrical test medium and and study the impacts of your materials and process characterization. And so on the material side, 
you could look at different solder paste that you wanted to consider in, in your build process and say, how active is that residue if I were to leave it behind? And secondly, if I do clean it, if I leave some errant residue behind, how active is that residue then? Because there's big differences in these solder paste materials. We've seen it across the board. Some materials are totally safe in that regard. Um, secondly, you could look at different component types and you could say, um, if, if, I'm, if I characterize my soldering materials, what about my reflow conditions? Do, does that make a difference? Uh, you, can de you can detect that with certainty. And then if you're cleaning it, um, which cleaning material, if you wanna do a cleaning material comparison, you can see the differences. If you put it into a tool, and this is another key area that, that I often talk about is, is that you have to match the cleaning material to the cleaning tool. If, if they're not matched properly, uh, you, you can have the greatest tool in the world, but if you don't bring the right material set to it, you hamper that tool's ability to do its job. And so you can start to dial those, those characteristics in and you can look at those material sets and you can determine on your process conditions, how long does it really take to clean this part? One of the, one of the challenges that people have, have seen out there, Mike, is, is when these more challenging components are placed on the board, it's not that they can't be cleaned. In some cases, you gotta clean them for a longer period of time and people, you know, that, that really slows down a process, but how do you really know that? So, so this tool that, that we designed, it's, what's interesting is, is that uh, an SIR test in, in its process qualification or validation is a test that really takes 168 hours. It's part of, of the standard. But part of the novel piece of this instrument is, is that we combine sensors with networks. And so the data sets are being run real time. And to be honest with you, it only takes a very short period of time to, to see the trending of where that data is going. And those real time data feeds start to speak to you and you can start to learn from them and you can start to, to simulate them to real world conditions and you can respond to them. So, so in the process of that, going back and looking at it from a customer site, it gives them the ability to get visibility into their product to discover problematic areas and to say, what do I need to do in my process to bring it into control? So it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's taking a tried and true approach. And it's, it, it's not to say that electrical testing is better than chemical testing. You need them both. But in the aspect of doing it, it, it starts to give people data that, that they can rely on. It takes the blackness out of the process, Mike. It, it takes the unknowns away so that they can start to understand, they can start to, to see, okay, this might be a problematic area. How do I address it? And back to your earlier point, it can now start to, to push back upfield to those component guys and say, you know, these components that you're making have certain specific issues that our customers have to deal with. How do we correct that? How do we work together to get that better? So that was the whole motivation, Mike. It was really trying to, to answer the research question of saying, how do we bring some additional capability to the manufacturing site so that once a process is qualified and validated, now how do we make sure that it stays that way over the many years that it could run in the assembly environment. Yeah, it, it kind of is a, it takes a village approach to ensure boards are clean. I, I see not one method um, to determine if boards are clean, not one practical method anyway. I see it as a village approach. So for example, a rose tester can spot a change in the process. Doesn't mean it's bad or good. It just spots a change, sends a flag up. SIR, like yours and others, um, can prove out a process in advance to, to, to have confidence that, that the process is as good as it can be. 
Uh, and then perhaps ion chromatography could be the you know last resort because it's expensive for most people um, to determine what the contamination is on the actual assembly that would normally be stuck into an airplane or or a pacemaker. It there seems to be a uh, a number of methods, and in concert, um, they seem to all make sense. Uh, you know, there's there's not one machine that will just take a board and within 10 seconds on the actual board say, yep, that's shippable. And those days are gone because to say, yeah, that's shippable, that's clean enough it is very subjective. And one has to know a lot of information about the board uh, before one can put a stamp of approval on it. So it does seem to be a very um, collaborative uh, village approach to determining cleanliness. One thing that interested me about your specific product was it, combines, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or, or clarify it, it provides some element of a test chamber uh, for the testing. I think you're doing some SIR testing at elevated temperature and humidity. A am I right on that? Yes. When you run an SIR test, Mike, you can run it at different uh, in, uh, temperatures and uh, relative humidity environments. So a, a true SIR test, um, let me do this. A true SIR test requires some level of a temperature humidity bias effect. And so that means you need an environmental chamber to, to be hooked into the actual tool itself. So one of the things that when people ran this type of testing and this testing has commonly been, it is commonly done in failure analysis and reliability labs, you, you bring together different pieces of that to, to integrate it together. What we felt was is, is that if you were to bring this tool to a production floor, it needs to be an integrated tool. Just like your tool, Mike, when you bring it to the marketplace, it is fully contained. You write all the different aspects and build the different aspects into your tool so somebody can operate it easily. And, and that's what we're trying to do here you do need that environmental chamber. So if you do need it, why not integrate it? Why not work with somebody who builds those chambers so that it makes it easy for the customer to actually run that test? Now, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm a big believer in, in um, the, the closest thing to a crystal ball we have in this industry is heat and uh, moisture uh, because that is an age accelerator. And uh, so many times we test boards in, in sterile settings and everything comes out great. And then they, we put them into harsh environments and everything comes out bad. So I, I like the crystal ball approach. Mike, uh, you're going to be, I think you're going to be in Amsterdam April 2nd through 4th at the SMTA Harsh Environment Conference. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I'm one of the uh, technical chairs in, in helping to organize that conference. And so uh, I will be there. Mike, you were there last year. Uh, we're excited about the program this year. The program is really strong. We, we've we been fortunate to, to, to see more and more companies want to participate in that, to be able to share their knowledge. And so I'm excited to be, be a part of the, the process. And hopefully we, we will have a successful conference in a few weeks. Yeah, uh, not only is it a, a technically relevant conference, it's in Amsterdam. So it's a, <laughs> the best of both worlds. It's a beautiful city. Uh, Mike. Oh, yes, it is. Not only is it a beautiful city, Mike, but the food is great. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah, very well. Um, well, Mike, this has been a joy. Thank you so much for, for joining me today on, uh, on this episode of Reliability Matters. I know uh, it's very hard to pin you down because you are on the road all the time uh, giving lectures and, and chairing conferences and teaching workshops and writing articles and all the, all the various things you do uh, there at Kaizen. But I, I really appreciate you carving out uh, an hour or so for me, and I really appreciate you being part of this podcast. You bring a lot of value. Well, Mike, thank you for the invitation. It's um I guess if, if we back up and, and just summarize this, you know, we all are, are in this to help our customers get a, a better process, a better, it, to, be, to, to understand, to, to learn. And it, it, it really requires us working together across industry. And I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate your idea that reliability matters because it does matter. 
And so as you move forward in, in um, helping people learn and, and understand these issues, I just appreciate the opportunity to be a part of that. Yeah, well, it's a mutual admiration society. Uh, I, I do appreciate you being here. You do add value to this podcast and to our industry. So, Mike, thank you very much. I wish you uh, safe travels um, uh, on to Amsterdam and beyond. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Have a good day. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to Reliability Matters. If you like what you hear, please be sure to give us a like. Just click the like or heart button below. If there are any reliability-based questions you'd like to have answered or specific topics discussed, let me know. I can be reached at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes or follow us on Spotify. You can also listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, aqueoustech.com, pcbchat.com, spreaker.com, or our newest affiliate, Ascendo Reliability on reliability.fm, a site dedicated to all things reliability. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Reliability Matters. In the meantime, keep doing it right.